Welcome to another episode of Jews in the World. I am Phyllis Zimbler Miller, and I have a very interesting guest today. Robert Aitken is professor of imperial history, which he's going to explain, at Sheffield Hallam University. He works in the history of a Black presence in Germany, and we are particularly going to talk about some of his areas of research, including World War II. And the reason I say is very interesting is because I heard him speak in a Holocaust program about the Nuremberg Laws and Blacks, and I've asked him to talk about laws as pertain to Jews, as pertain to Blacks, the intersection, that word, or, or not intersection, and take it away. How would you like to start explaining, including what imperial history is? <laughs> yeah, thanks very much, Phyllis. Um, it's great to be with you. I am a professor of imperial history because to begin with, I studied European colonialism, explicitly German colonialism. I was interested in German Southwest Africa, uh, which is present day Namibia, which was a settler colony. And that's where we have this first genocide of the 20th century, where the Germans uh, murder and try to ethnically cleanse the Herero Nama people. Um, after I finished writing my uh, PhD, I was living in Berlin. I had been interested in a longer history of black people in Germany and had tried to do that as my PhD. But in the late 1990s, I think archives, uh, archivists weren't really aware of this as an issue. So finding material was very difficult. But when I was living in Berlin, I just started looking around the archives to see what I could find. Um, I was fortunate to have read a book by a lady called Katharina Augentoya, which took one life story of a black man who lived in Germany. And she'd done a lot of archival research. So I followed her footsteps. Uh, and over time, I collected more and more material. And I was just quite amazed, frankly, that there was this entire history of Black people in Germany, which had been effectively left out of traditional narratives of German history. Um, really incredible life stories of, of men and women who had been present there for uh, decades, in some cases, centuries. So that's what I look at now. I look at uh, this history of a black presence really beginning in the 1880s. That's when Germany seizes its colonial territories and up to 1945, the collapse of uh, the Nazi uh, regime, which really by that time, a black community has been decimated. You know, what? for all of those who are not as up in history, I want to point out that while the Jews had lived in Germany for hundreds and hundreds of years, the black population of Germany, you will correct me, came only because of colonialism. Is that correct? Could you explain? No, that? I, I would say that's that that's that's not correct. But that, that I I think that's one of the myths of the the literature. Actually, you can trace a black presence in Germany back to the early modern period, so the twelve hundreds, uh, oh, perhaps really? even further back to the Roman time period. What colonialism does is it creates a more permanent and unsettled black population. And it brings more people than ever previously. But we, we can see in the 16th, 17th century, uh, Africans as servants in princely courts uh, of, of German nobles and members of the elite. Uh, there are occasionally um, bi biographies of the likes of Anton Wilhelm Amel, who was an Enlightenment thinker, um, effectively handed over to German princes as a gift but who then went on to um, lecture at German universities. So an African man who really achieves uh, considerable feats. But many of these stories have been kind of ignored by historians and mainstream history. So the, the black presence is much, much longer. Okay, so that's why I wanted you to correct me. Now, I do have another question, though, about citizenship. Mm -hmm. The Jews before, you know, German Jews fought in World War I on the German side. They really believed many of them to, unfortunately, their death, that they were German citizens. What was the uh, citizenship in terms of colonials coming yeah. to Germany? How does that work? I mean, that's a great question, and it's quite a complex situation. But <laughs> bear, 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 bear with me, bear with me. So if we think who's, who's coming to Germany pre-1914, uh, I mean, there are thousands of Black people coming, but not many are staying. So there might be African-Americans. Wait, wait, why, might... aren't they, why aren't they staying? Let me come to that. Let me tell you who's coming, and then we'll think about why okay. they might or might not stay. So we, we, you have people from African-Americans who might be performers. You have people from South America. You have people from all over Africa. In particular, though, you have people from the German territories of Cameroon and Togo. 
a few from Tanzania, much less from Namibia. Why are people coming? So they're coming as servants, maybe to colonial bureaucrats, when the bureaucrats are on home leave. So that means they might stay for a few weeks, mm -hmm. months, not longer. They're often coming as members of human zoos. So these, these uh, zoos that are put on to entertain white audiences where black people are expected to perform blackness, African traditions, uh, very much a kind of racialized, objectified scenario. But hundreds and hundreds of people will come as part of these, sh these shows. They also don't stay. We have black sailors who might go to Hamburg and Bremen, stay for weeks, months, but not really long term. Um, there are youngsters sent at their parents' cost to be educated in Europe. So members of the African elites, um, and they might spend a number of years being schooled. But of course, what the colonial authorities don't want is them going to university education. So they might be allowed to go to primary education, then secondary education, then they need to return to help work in the colonial economy. So why do people end up staying? 1914 and the war, because the war breaks out and all the black people who are living in Germany at that time are effectively stuck. You can't go back. So that's why we don't have many people stay. Let me come back to your question though about citizenship. Almost all the people who come are men. If they come from a German colonial territory, they're not German citizens. They are German colonial subjects. Mm. If that sounds kind of vague, it is because it's quite vague. The Germans don't envisage them staying. So that status really applies to the colonial arena, to the colonies itself, where there's a clear racial hierarchy. You are either a citizen, that means largely white, European, or you're a subject with far lesser rights. Um, they have a dual legal system, one that privileges the white settler population and one that really works against uh, the black African population. So they don't have citizenship. Okay, so what happens as we as Hitler takes power at the end of January 1933? Now what happens? How do the, the so the Jews are citizens still at that point until 1935? Yeah. The blacks who live in Germany are not. So let's so consider. You know what become it becomes even more complicated because obviously in 1919 Germany has no more colonies. Right? So you because go from being Exactly. You go from being a colonial subject to being a former colonial subject. So what does that mean? In theory, if you come from the colonies, you're now under the legal protection of the state that takes over the German territories under the Versailles Peace Treaty. So that means uh, Togo goes to France. Most of Cameroon goes to France. A little bit goes to Britain. Tanzania goes to Britain. In theory you are legally protected by these states. But you're only legally protected if the French and the British are interested in this. And quite frankly, they're not really. So what I would suggest is we view Africans from the former colonies as being stateless. And that means any German woman they marry, any children that they have with a partner, legally inherits that status as well. So they're stateless. Okay, I think I think um, we need to explain something that I only learned a few years ago. In Germany at that time, citizenship went only through the male. Yeah, that's why. I mean, in America, you know, you married an American woman, your children would be American whether you were. But in Germany, even a German woman who's a, been there hundreds of years. Yeah. If her husband is not German, the children do not have German citizenship. Okay, we needed to exactly. explain this. Because... Yeah, and, and that is important because if you're stateless, well, what does that mean for you? It means it's really difficult to find a job. It means it's very difficult to travel. Uh, it's difficult to find accommodation. And when the Nazis come to power, you have no legal protection against the state that chooses to see you as an outsider and might use state violence against you. So the very fact that these men come from the colonies in the first place impacts on their entire lives once they get to Germany because their legal status is tied up to these lack of rights that they've had 
almost really from the beginning. So were there black lawyers in 1933 the way there were Jewish lawyers in Germany, for example, and doctors? Yeah, I, not in terms of the resident population, the people who stay long term. So you might have people who visit, say African Americans, Liberians, but, but they're passing through mainly. The resident population, so Cameroonians, Togolese, their children, Tanzanians, um, they are increasingly excluded even over the 1920s from normal forms of employment. Yes, I was so, talking about employment. I was yeah, thinking of when yeah. the Jews were dismissed from civil service jobs, for example. I mean, I don't think this this isn't this isn't a policy, it's more of a practice. So if a young Cameroonian came to Germany pre-1914 to train to be a, a blacksmith or a carpenter, the aim was always that he carried out that work in Africa, not in Germany. So it's much more difficult if they're stuck in Germany to find work in your area of training. At the same time, though, um, a lot of Americans are uh, sorry, a lot of Germans are taken with American culture, with these big blockbuster films, with jazz, um, mm -hmm. with the review shows. So almost de facto, through choice or otherwise, black people are becoming performers because that gives them a bit more money and a bit more stability. And by the time the Nazis come to power, you know, effectively, that is the almost the only form of employment that they can find. I see. I'm rethinking of something that I read recently, and I under, I'm beginning to see, I mean, it's beginning to fall into place. So now let's talk about the Nuremberg Laws of September 1935 and what happened then. Yeah, so it is worthwhile saying that um, I think the situation for Black people gets worse even before the Nazis come to power. If you read personal testimonies, they are already saying, you know, by the late 1920s, early 1930s, with the rise of the Nazis and the rise of right-wing extremism, but also with the economic depression, things are really starting to get to, to go wrong. Okay, um, let me just let me just say something because I only learned this recently and I've been fascinated. As soon as Germany started, as soon as it lost the war, it started the stab in the back. Mm -hmm. campaign in which Jews in Germany and communists were blamed for the loss of the war. So even though between the wars and the war period, the Jews yeah. still got to hold their jobs and stuff, they also faced discrimination. But Blacks were not part of the stab in the back uh, target, were they? They're not, but without wanting to make things even more complicated. <laughs> um, during the 1920s, as part of the Versailles Settlement, um, part of the Rhineland is occupied. Yes. And, and the, the French deliberately use colonial troops. I, colonial yeah, troops come from, yes. yes. Yeah, so they're, they're, coming from, they're coming from Africa, uh, parts of Asia, and we have relationships developed between young German women and these French troops. Um, these are not violent relationships, but that's the way they're depicted at the time in, in the press. And there's a violent anti-racist campaign against France's use of black troops. Long story short, something like 900 children will be born out of these relationships, um, largely living in that Rhineland area. The German authorities over the course of the 1920s are looking at them. The Nazis are explicitly looking at them as well. So we have I hate to say two different black populations, but maybe it's easier for for our purposes, to think of a resident population that's made up of these Cameroonians and Togolese, people from the colonies with some African-Americans and people from the Caribbean. And then we also have these youngsters who are born in the Rhineland. So, yeah, that, that complicates things a little bit. But I think the Nazi policy towards both of these populations has the same goal in mind. And that policy is to prevent them from having children. So before we can even talk about the race laws, we need to think about these black youngsters in the Rhineland. Were they sterilized? Am I remembering that right? You are absolutely correct. Yeah. So um, Wilhelm Frick, who is the Minister of Interior, he calls a secret meeting in 1935. A lot of Nazi departments are there. A lot of state departments are there. And they discuss, what do we do with these children? They are becoming um, adolescents. They're likely to have sexual partners soon. So what do we do? 
And they come to the decision that although policy that exists doesn't cover this, so the existing sterilization laws won't cover it, this is the most foolproof way of preventing them from reproducing. So this secret decision is taken, full in the knowledge that this is an illegal action. And then in 1937, on Hitler's, specifically Hitler's orders and Frick's orders, roughly 400 of these children will be sterilized. So that throws up a question. If you sterilize these youngsters, why don't you just sterilize all black people? That's a little bit where your question about citizenship comes back into play. The Rhineland children, they grew up largely with their mothers. And their mothers are not, in almost all cases, not married to the French soldier. You might not even know he fathered a child. So under citizenship regulations, they are German citizens. And wait, so then no, we just we just got done saying citizenship. Ah, but, the, the, but the parents are not married. So they grow up with the mother. And so in that scenario, under German citizenship law, they are Germans. Let me repeat this. If the German woman is married, they don't she get loses German citizenship. her citizenship. She loses her citizenship. But because this doesn't happen in this case, in this she's not married, she can yeah. pass down citizenship to her children. Indeed. So the Nazis believe that these children form an internal policy problem. And that they, they talk about would the League of Nations here intervene, would other states intervene, and they reach the conclusion that the League of Nations really has nothing to say about these children. It has no right to intervene in the measures they take. On the other hand, though, they think, okay, if we take action against the children of Cameroonians and Togolese, or, or, or let's say uh, Japanese or Chinese, these states could intervene. The French and the British might suddenly find a voice to criticize what's happening. It could impact on international relations and foreign trade. So they decide that systematically sterilizing other black residents is not possible. But that's where the Nuremberg race laws could come into play. Because the aim of the race laws is to prevent marriages. One of the aims of the race laws is to prevent marriages that will lead to children being born. Exactly. So the race laws, uh, as you know, are introduced and they specifically target Germany's Jewish population. But within several days, they will be extended by Wilhelm Frick, and the guy who calls the meeting about the Rhineland children, they'll be extended to cover Germany's black population and the Sintia Roma, explicitly yes. to stop these marriages and explicitly to stop children being born. Yes, and he, he's British. He's using a euphemism. He's saying sexual being born means not just marriages, but sexual relations become outlawed. Yeah. Only... When it pertains to Germany's black population, it's only the marriage that's outlawed. Really? There's no, yeah, there's no fine print to say that the Nazis can take any further action. But in effect, in, in reality, um, so if a black person had a relationship with a German person, Rassenschande, so-called racial shame that applies to Jews, that doesn't apply to black people. And it, yeah, you look surprised. And I'm sure... When I read some of the reports, I think even the policing authorities are a bit surprised when confronted with this, but they nonetheless take action. So the act, I think we can say in the spirit of the laws, they go beyond what the law entitles them to do, and they will actively try and break up partnerships once they become aware of them. How do so they we do can't. That? So we can say we can say that a number of. Um, Black and European couples, they attempt to get married. Uh, all but, I think, in two cases, uh, they are rejected. And we can talk about the two cases maybe later because they're kind of exceptional. But in almost every other case, they are not given permission to marry. If you wanted to get married, you needed to be medically examined and you needed to hand over your genealogical data. And then a health registrar would either say, yes, you can marry or no, you can't. If a negative decision is made, which happens to the case of all these black men and women, that information then will be passed on to the Gestapo, 
or the criminal police. And then the criminal police and the Gestapo are aware of your relationship. And this is what I mean by acting in the spirit. They will then intervene to try and split up a couple. Now, before 1940, before the outbreak of the Second World War, they will do this through threats of violence. And that's normally enough. After 1940, they will enact those threats of violence. So that is, in the first case, largely sterilization. They will sterilize the black partner, although at least in one occasion as well, they also sterilize a white partner. Or they will send people to concentration camps or um, incarcerate them in prisons. Okay, now let's define, because we're also going to talk about the I, not wearing a yellow star. By cons- There were concentration camps and there were concentration camps. Yeah. So were the Blacks sent to death camps, once extermination camps? No, I don't think this is really what we see happening. Instead, I think sterilization is the, the major threat against the Black population. Um, we need to put a number of things in perspective. The Black population is not large. So I mentioned there was maybe uh, 900 uh, so-called Rhineland children in the 1920s. By the time the Nazis come to power, that number's maybe a little bit smaller, maybe six, 700. Um, if we think about the other resident population, we're talking maybe about two, two and a half thousand. So that's that's small. Right. I can't remember uh, the percentage of Jews in Germany at the time, but it's much larger. Uh, it, it, it's much, it is significantly larger. And the population of Sinti and Roma is significantly larger. Um, Black people are also visible, highly visible to the authorities in many ways. One, because they're stateless, and that means that they be, they're they given an alien's passport already, 1933, 1934. If you have an alien's passport, that means you need to check in with the police regularly, which makes you visible. Uh, they are visible on the basis of their skin color. They're visible in the areas in which they live, in the towns and, and cities. So that kind of mass murder and the, and the sense of people being sent to death camps doesn't happen. But what you do see, again, from 1940 or so onwards, when the war breaks out, is an increase in the sterilizations and incarceration. So we see people being sent to sanatoriums. We see them being sent to forced labor camps. We see them being sent to concentration camps like Sachsenhausen uh, or Neugama. In both, in both in Germany. Uh, yes, indeed. You do not see them being sent to, to the to the death camps in that sense. But that's because I think sterilization is the tactic that the Nazis are using. What I have observed a little bit, and finding the evidence is difficult because the Nazis destroy a lot of stuff. And they also, on death certificates, they hide things mm. through the cause of death. So... We don't know what happened to a lot of black people who were still living in Germany in 1939. We know that many of those in 39 are still alive in 45, but what actually happened in that in-between period is quite quite difficult to find out. But we can see threats of youngsters quite literally being threatened with sterilization, regardless as to whether they're getting married or whether they're even having a girlfriend or a boyfriend. It does seem to appear that the Nazis are just literally picking up black youngsters and threatening them with sterilization, not just in Germany, but also there is evidence of this happening in uh, Austria after the Anschluss. So there's a number of racial examinations of black, black youngsters in Austria. And so at the moment, myself and my PhD student are trying to work out what happens after the examinations. Interesting. And what about France? I just... Uh... The yeah. BB, isn't it the BBC program World on Fire, where one of the main characters, fictional, fictional, but uh, is very interesting, is a French colonial, uh, is, I don't yeah. is that the right word, and he's very worried in the occupation. So what was the attitude towards those Blacks? I think we can see some of the, some of the Black people in Germany, they, they flee to France. But of course, the Nazis and the Gestapo follow them there. Right. But I think the pressure is less intense as it is in Germany itself and in Austria. I do think there are suspicious plans being made. Hmm. So um, in 1942, in October, Heinrich Himmler, who's the head of the SS, 
chief of the security of police, he sends out an order to all police stations throughout occupied Europe, not just Germany. And he wants a kind of statistical registration of, of all black people in districts. He wants to know their names. He wants to know their citizenship. He wants to know uh, their jobs. And that information is to be sent to the police department, Department 5, which is run by a guy called Ata Neba. Neba is one of the men who takes the action against the Sinti and Roma. And a similar process against the Sinti and Roma starts in 1938 when they are being systematically, um, information is being systematically brought in against them. So that documentation to me is quite suspicious that Himmler is doing this. That he's doing it in 1942 when the, when really the action against Sinti and Roma is taking place. It suggests that maybe something is being planned. Whatever that is, it doesn't appear to happen. And we could speculate why is there no mass murder for, for multiple reasons. And I think it, one of the big ones is, you know, 42 to 43, the war is shifting. That's what I, that's the first thing that appear, uh, occurred to me. Yeah, I think also um, the black population is small. So actually finding people is difficult. People are in hiding and people are moving when they're in hiding. I think they are seen as clearly not central part of um, the Nazis' racial policies. I'm not saying they're an afterthought. I don't think they are, but there are other priorities. I think also we do see occasions where local where neighbors help and hide people, where I think also local police perhaps also shield black people who've been living there for decades. So there's multiple reasons why we don't see a, a kind of a mass action carried through. Let me just, I know this is not your area, but I know you know. The Sinti and Roma were sent to the death camps, though, to the extermination camps. Uh, auschwitz birkenau Yes, yes. And I do know at one point they were allowed to live in what was called the gypsy camp. And then they were cleared out and all sent one night or day to uh, the um, gas chambers because then that camp was taken over by the Czechia family camp, I think, because I've been doing research about the Jews from Czechia. And, the and there were also of Moravian, <laughs> Bohemian Moravia. Yes, go ahead. And, and there, were, there were also killing centers like Hadama, um, which were set up for Sinti and Roma. Um, and there, there were a couple of black Germans who were caught up in some of those actions as well and sent to some of those. But like um, there was a family in Wiesbaden where, um, to give you a sense of what I mean by the Nazis starting to take action against really quite young black youngsters. In Wiesbaden, there were a lot of the Rhineland children, but there were also children of the likes of Togolese. And in one family, you know, girls as young as 10, as 10 or 11, were being seen as a sexual danger by the Nazis and sterilized on that account. And these children were to be sent to the gypsy hole, to the so-called Sinti and Roma holding camp where um, but the Sinti and Roma were murdered. The children didn't end up there because the end of the war intervened in time for them to be saved, but they were sterilized as indeed was a younger brother who was only 10 when he was sterilized. Was there any um, compensation for these this, these children after the war? What a great question. Yeah, I mean, that, 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 is a, that is a great question. Some black victims gain compensation, but they gain it largely because they couldn't finish their education or they could not find a job. Oh. They rarely gained it on the basis of sterilization. They rarely gained it on the basis of um, incarceration. I think one of the biggest problems that the black victims faced they were it's important to say the black victims were supported by jewish victim groups who, who really you know gave lawyers given documentation the problem was a lot of the bureaucrats making a decision on a claim had no idea who these black people were it's like they'd forgotten colonial history that the germans ever had colonies and so the first thing black people had to do was explain what they were doing in nazi germany in the first place hope that the official was empathetic i don't think only in one out of 46 cases i've looked at did any officials look at nazi racial policy towards black people so they didn't even bother with that while i think it was easy for not easy jewish victims could say look at the nuremberg race laws that explicitly pertains to us if black people said that 
most officials had no idea that the race laws had actually been extended to include them. So getting evidence was really difficult for black people. And I think that's one of the reasons why the stories became lost. Because after 45, people are saying, I am a victim. This is what happened to me. But those on the other side of the desk are not listening. And eventually, I think people just stopped telling their stories. And like a lot of Jewish victims, I think the trauma was so much for others, they just never told their stories. Yes. Uh, when my husband and I came back to the United States, uh, he was honorably discharged in 72. I started working for a Jewish publication, uh, a weekly newspaper, The Exponent in Philadelphia. And I published first, I was editor of the monthly literary supplement. And I published um, firsthand accounts, survivors and saviors. I thought the saviors accounts were very important. And after I had a very nice collection of these, I went to the then editor of the Jewish Publication Society, a major uh, book publication society. This is in the 70s, before Roots and Holocaust TV shows. And I said, you know, I think that this is a book. This, you know, this is firsthand. And I was told, no, they're not professional writers. So yeah. that was the attitude for not just yeah. you know the forties and 50, it extended for a long time. In many cases, I do think the TV shows, roots series, roots and and a, and a Holocaust changed, and it began to be talked about. Yeah, so that's I, I, I was just going to say, and that's why I want to continue to talk about it because especially now people really need to understand what happens when you other is that a verb people definitely. I mean, that, that's one of the reasons why I think the research and the field is so important. I try and make clear to my students um, the stories of these, these Black Germans pre-1945, they speak very much to the experiences of asylum seekers and refugees and stateless people today who are going through a similar process of, of being othered and excluded. Uh, rhetoric matters. Language matters. Because that feeds into practice and that feeds into policy. Uh, the racialization of, of black people and Jewish people, not just during the Nazi period, but even before that, we can see that played out in many things that are happening around the world today. Yes, unfortunately. So this has been such an interesting conversation, and I have a lot of other questions, but I realize that our list, my listeners may not want to know as much as I do. They, so is there something major that we haven't, that you'd really like I mean, I think it's important that there are a lot of connections between Jews and black people in Germany, uh, partly um, because many Jews lived or were marginalized and, and found work in the performance arena. Uh, there are a number of marriages between Jews and um, men from the former colonies. Uh, we see groups trying to help one another. Um, a kind of remarkable story that I stumbled across um, three, four years ago was of a Cameroonian man who had a boxing club. And the Gestapo visited him because um, they were a bit concerned about his tax returns of all things. But when they went there, they were even more surprised that in 1937, 38, he was running dance evenings for Jews. So he was creating this, you know, this kind of safe space for them right. to... to to come I, out I, and I just want to explain to the audience. He was giving them a chance to socialize when they had already been excluded from many such places. So he was doing a wonderful, wonderful social service. Yeah. So the actual file doesn't really kind of give you the end of the story. So I the fact that the Gestapo got involved was clearly not a good sign for him. The next thing I know about him, I think six months later, he and his white German wife are living in France. So I suspect that they, it was quite clear that they couldn't continue doing what they were doing and that there would be severe repercussions. But he survived, he certainly survives um, the Second World War. That's good. And I'm sure the, uh, the Jews that were able to go to his dance club while it was open really appreciated this opportunity yep. to, to just a few, an hour or so, not thinking about what was going on. It, it seemed to have been very popular. The Gestapo were quite surprised about the number of people, and particularly youngsters who, who were there. So, Ravi, I thank you so much for taking your time to share with my audience. And I do think this is a topic that more people should know about. 
and and just realize this is all part of a fabric that we need to know so that history doesn't repeat itself, if I can say that, in a negative way, but only in a positive way. Indeed, so. yeah. Thanks very much for having me. It's been great. Thank you.